All right, my friends, welcome once again to the next episode here, the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A on the RDP YouTube channel, where we are simplifying fitness to help you escape the diet and exercise rat race via a fundamental approach. My name is Matt Schifferly, and today's episode, we are talking about fear. In the last episode last week, I talked a little bit about how I was struggling with a, a bunch of anxiety over the past year, I opened up a little bit about that. A lot of you let me know, wrote in on Instagram and emails about how much you appreciate me sharing these sorts of things. And if there's one thing that I've learned over the past year and researching my latest book, Be Fit, Live Free, it's that we humans are fundamentally emotional creatures and that our lives in general, not to mention our fitness ability to do everything, lose weight, build muscle, improve our performance, all of this stuff is based upon a foundation of how we are emotionally set. And when we are coming from our uh, pursuit of things with a more negative emotional orientation, it's far more difficult to achieve those results that you want. As I always say, you cannot build a positive result when you're coming from a negative place. And that especially goes with emotional orientation. And in this episode, I'm going to be exposing several messages within our fitness culture that kind of promote this fear, anxiety-based messaging within our fitness culture that I know a lot of times it, it feels like it's empowering. It feels like it's something that you should know, like, oh, you've got to watch out for what they're putting in the food supply and everything. And you got to watch out for what you're doing, your workouts, or you're going to kill your gains, bro, and all these other sorts of things. But the reason why these fear messages exist is not for your best interest. It's not to protect you. It's not to expose the truth or anything like that. It's pure marketing, my friends, because fear sells. Anxiety sells. If I can convince you that there's this invisible problem out there that you didn't even know about before and that, oh, I can get you fearful of it, I can get you anxious about it, then you're going to be much more hungry to gobble up whatever, quote, solution that I pose to you. And one of the most deceptive things about a lot of these fear-based messages in our fitness culture is that they're based on an element of truth. So it's not like they're outright lies or misconceptions, but they're warped and distorted perceptions of what's going on. And that's what we're going to be exposing today is where do these messages, where, where are they kind of uh, truthful? and faithful in the representation of what's going on and where are they just going completely off the rails and they're making you think it's a mountain when really it's a molehill and nothing you really need to worry about. And before we jump into that, I wanted to quickly shout out again, this today's episode is brought to you by all of the resources over at reddeltaproject.com. Of course, all of my books that I've written over the years to help you be fit and live free, including my latest book, be Fit, Live Free, which covers a lot of the information in today's episode, especially on the emotional impacts of motivation and how to foster a greater sense of motivation, purpose, and clarity in your fitness pursuits. And also, of course, my latest coaching programs that are now available. Really excited to be bringing remote coaching to the stable of services that I'm offering because really one of the great things I love about calisthenics training is that it's simple, it's efficient, you can do it on your own time with whatever equipment and resources that you have on hand. But in my profession as being a personal trainer and fitness coach, you have to be at a certain place at a certain time. You have to work with my schedule and your schedule and all these sorts of hoops we got to jump through in order for coaching to be a viable option. But what remote coaching does is it removes all those obstacles. You can train wherever you are in the world. You can train on your own schedule. You can train with whatever program that you like. You can train with whatever equipment that you like and prefer to use. It removes all of those barriers. So check it out. There's details down below. It's just the link to reddeltaproject.com. Up on the menu bar, you can find links to everything, the coaching that I offer, the books that I offer, podcast videos, everything is over at reddeltaproject.com. I redid the website, brand new website several months ago, really proud of it, much easier to find everything that you're looking for. And uh, it's definitely worth the checkout if you want to do that. And again, also uh, offer remote coaching, which is a very short, uh, or uh, micro coaching, which is short term 
coaching where you can ask me questions, have me evaluate your program, look at your technique and so on. Again, reddeltaproject.com. Okay, bills are paid. Let's get into this. So I'm reminded a little bit of that quote. I think it was Kennedy who said, we have nothing to fear, but fear itself. But when we look at that, it looks like it's he's trivializing things, like we really have nothing to worry about. But if there's anything that we've recognized, especially with the internet and social media and everything coming about, is that it's become blatantly apparent that fear can be weaponized. Our emotional orientations, if you will, how we feel about things can be literally manipulated against our own interests. And this is nothing new. I mean, advertisers and uh, the uh, sales tactics and stuff have understood this stuff for decades. Uh, there's no power in brainwashing anybody. People are like, oh, they got brainwashed. Oh, they go. Brain there's no power in brainwashing someone. What the real power is, is in the, in the emotional manipulation pursuits. And I'm not saying it's always done in nefarious ways or anything. It's just simply that a lot of people out there who seek to have influence over people have understood that if you really want to hit someone, you hit them in the heart, not the mind. If you can get someone to feel a certain way about your product, they'll buy it. If, they can, if you can get someone to feel a certain way about your cause or your mission and stuff, they'll endorse it. Or it could be the other way. If you could get someone to feel in a negative way against your opponents or something, they will uh, antagonize them. I'll go against it sort of thing. And so being able to control and have more influence over our uh, emotional standpoint is very empowering in both our fitness and our quality of life. But if we're not aware of these messages, because that's the thing is fear and anxiety are often more subconsciously and kind of implanted into you. These messages are often done without our even knowing it, or we readily accept these messages because we think that's in our best interest. And you're going to see that sort of thing in a lot of the things that we are addressing today. And speaking of addressing, let me get to some of these questions here. Adam is saying, I know you've heard of auto-regulation training. Yep, I've got a new ebook coming out on that fairly soon. Do you think that some people just can't handle auto-regulation? People will almost always take the path of least resistance. What's your view on it? A lot to unpack here. Uh, first off is auto-regulation is how we do most everything in life, right? We don't go to the bathroom on a set schedule. We auto-regulate it. When we're driving our car to work, we're auto-regulating to a large degree our speed and our ability to drive the car according to things like road conditions or the how heavy traffic is and stuff. By far, the majority of ways that we effectively do anything in life is through auto-regulation. It's because we are doing what's best in our given circumstance. And you talk about here, do you think people can't handle it? I think most people will handle it a heck of a lot better. They just need to know a couple little key things about what they should be doing because it's not about uh, doing things that are necessarily easy. It's what's easiest to achieve the objective. And that's what I'm going to be covering in my new book. But you say people will almost always take the path of least resistance. Yes, as they should. Okay, so this is one of those messages out there that is prevalent in our fitness culture that we're told to fear, that we're told is a bad thing, that we humans are prone to the path of least resistance. And I'm here to tell you the path of least resistance is entirely beneficial. It is 100% beneficial and good to, well, first off, you don't have a choice in the matter. You will always follow the path of least resistance. You don't get a choice in that. It is our human nature to always have the most efficient path. The only thing you can choose and have any control over is where is that path going? Okay? Where is that path headed? And that's the big thing that most people are missing in their pursuits of health and fitness is we don't know what objectives we're trying to achieve in our workouts and with our diet. And that's what I address in many of my books, micro workouts, be fit, live free, smart body weight training. Most people are just blindly groping around in the dark when it comes to diet and exercise, hoping that they're going to get what they want through just pouring out plenty of blood, sweat, and tears working as hard as possible, crossing their fingers, and just hoping it's going to somehow magically work in the end. That's the strategy almost everybody uses in fitness. And it's a bad strategy because even if you can be successful at it, you're probably going to spend far more time and energy and sometimes even money achieving that result when it could, in fact, take a fraction 
of those resources. And easier is always better. If you can find an easier way to lose weight, an easier way to build muscle, an easier way to shoot a free throw on a basketball court, it will be more effective 100% of the time. 100%. And when I say easier, I'm not saying less effort. We're always going to put in a lot of work. We're always going to put in effort. There's that article that went around. You sometimes see this on uh, video too. Someone transcribed it a little bit where it's like being fat and out of shape is hard. Getting to the gym and eating right is hard. Choose your hard. Being financially responsible and independent is hard. Racking up credit card debt and uh, having terrible financial uh, abilities is hard. Nobody ever has an easy path in life. The only thing we can establish is creating an easier path to the direction and the goals and the pursuits that we want to have. And nobody's going to have <clears throat> a path of no resistance. We follow the path of least resistance. And we will always follow that path. Some people have a path of least resistance geared, geared towards poor health, being overweight, and being weak. Other people have built a path of least resistance towards strength, virility, and power. And when we have adaptive training and diet and exercise habits, what we were talking about, it empowers you to actually build that path for yourself and making it much easier to get what you want and keep those results as well. So we're empowering our ability to use the path of least resistance. You don't ever want to fight that. There's so many of those messages out there. Oh, you know, it's it's um kind of like oh, I heard this a lot back in the you know my short stint in the the CrossFit days. It's like we're fundamentally you know we're cavemen. We're paleo this and paleo that, and uh, you know we're going to if we were left to our own devices, then you're going to do nothing but watch TV and eat junk food all day long. That is complete BS. Nobody wants that unless they want the the actual outcomes that come from that. But the challenge that we often find is, again, we have no purpose behind our diet and exercise habits. We don't know what we're actually trying to accomplish when we're doing them. And that's why we're not motivated to do them. That's why we don't see a point in doing a lot of those things that take a lot of effort because we don't know what objective and purpose they're actually trying to, to provide. But when you understand those purposes, you get so much more clarity and it's much easier to do things your own way to get vastly better results with a fraction of the effort along that path of least resistance. I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of where I'm going with this sort of thing, Adam. Leo's coming on in. Good to see you as always, my friend. Dan, hey Matt, wanted to share my experience with one set a day. Oh, you've been doing it as well. I've been doing one set a day. And this is an experiment I've been doing for the past several weeks, by the way, folks, if you're just joining in. Doing one set a day of upper core and leg exercise six days a week for a month. Results have been phenomenal. I second that, my friend, uh, Dan. I, I think it's uh, been very good. Now, I personally have been having quite, again, some issues myself. I had I got a, a cold the first week that I did it, so it was kind of hard to, to do it. And re recently, the past week especially, I've been having a lot of uh, emotional things come up that have been striking me in a psychoso psychosomatic way. So it's affecting me physically and stuff. But overall, the one set a day of taking an exercise, you have one set of it you do each day has been fantastic. Absolutely phenomenal. I may write a quick read on this in the near future because the more I'm looking into why it can work so well, the more I'm realizing that fundamentally it can be very empowering. So fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing. Len is saying, hey Matt, I've been experiencing hip discomfort in running. A physio provided some exercise. What's your view on stretching as part of exercise? Yeah, stretching is very good. I mean, you're always going to be stretching somehow in some way, shape, or form. You get into a push-up position. I'm stretching my chest. and stretching my triceps. Every movement involves stretching and elongating muscles because that's all stretching is, is elongating muscles. And every movement we ever do elongates our muscles. And <clears throat> if there's anything, you know, I know back in the day, I was always told, and I believe for a lot of times too, that strength training, building bigger muscles and stronger muscles is what made you tight. Boy, if you want a recipe for getting tight and stiff, it's cardio by far. Take small, little, short range movements and do them repeatedly thousands of times for hours on end. That's like the most biggest recipe for building yourself up to be super, super tight. As a cyclist myself, super tight to this day because of all those years I spent as a bike racer. And not that I've always always very limber to begin with, but um, yeah, definitely a big range of motion 
exercise. It doesn't need to be stretching. It can be strength exercises that use a great degree of mobility, like deep squats and lunges, back bridges, hanging from a pull-up bar, those sorts of things. It, remember, it doesn't need to be a stretch. It just needs to be any kind of exercise that uses a fairly big range of motion, elongate those muscles. But yeah, we definitely want that if we're cardio junkies. And finally, Zaid, it's good to see you saying uh, leg day can seem such a drag. Yes. What happens if I skip leg day completely? Will there be chronic consequences or any harm in general? Absolutely. So if you skip leg day, one, um, you will be forever shunned by society. You will become a leper upon all of even the, the lowest of class of the citizens. You will lose all social support. Your friends will pretend they don't uh, know you. Your family will disown you. Even your dog will growl at you every time you walk down uh, the hallway because he's lost all respect for you. Uh, you'll have no chance whatsoever of finding love and your body will wither away to a husk of its former self within a matter of months. See what I'm doing there? right? This is the sort of fear-based things that often propagate in our fitness culture. Now, of course, I'm exaggerating it for the sake of, you know, satire here, but it's not that far based off from what you hear a lot in our fitness culture where, okay, we found this little thing that in some circumstances could be detrimental. Now let's really what I call the doomsday effect. I wrote about this in my first book, fitness independence, that anything that's good in fitness culture becomes like utopian savior, the best thing ever. And anything that could potentially be harmful is like absolute catastrophic, the end of your world as you know it kind of stuff. And it's never anything in between. Uh, bottom line is don't skip leg day, my friend. Uh, and you don't need a whole heck of a lot. Usually when people are lamenting about leg day, they're like, oh, leg day sucks. I hate leg day. I'm like, then your programming probably sucks. Yes, it's challenging. Yes, it's very hard on mind and body. And it can really be, you know, very metabolically demanding because there's a lot of muscle involved and stuff. But the bottom line is you don't need to drive yourself into the ground when it comes to working your legs. You usually just need one or two exercises, do it a few sets a couple times a week, and you're good. You probably don't need to do nearly as much work as you are currently doing. But yeah, you definitely want to get your legs in. That was a mistake I made for the longest time. I was always that guy. I was like, oh, I don't need to work legs. I'm a bike racer. You know, I ride my bike all the time. That gets my legs. And to some degree, yeah, it does for sure. But now you know, I would say, well, of course I work my legs. Why? Because I ride my mountain bike. You know, I, that's why I work my legs. I want my legs to be strong and resilient so that the mountain bike doesn't beat them up. And I want to be a better biker. So we definitely want to address the entire body. We don't want to skip any of the fundamental tension chains. Uh, and that certainly includes our squat chain. But yeah, we're talking about fears and stuff. And some of the more prominent fears in our fitness culture that really are, again, they're based on a little bit of truth, but they get way blown out of, out of context. And one of the most prevalent areas where this happens is, of course, in the world of diet and nutrition. And so many messages out there are trying to find and blame all of our issues on some sort of dietary boogeyman. Oh, it's because of processed foods. Oh, it's because of fat. Oh, it's because of sugar. Or it's because of animal products. Or it's because of modern day foods and we need to eat more like our, our ancestors do. Or it could be now, I, I, know, I know it sounds crazy, but now you got people even saying that fruits and vegetables are bad for you and everything. Anybody who's saying these sorts of messages has maybe a good intent with it, but I know they don't understand how nutrition actually works. Because again, with our common messages in our fitness culture, we usually have a method-based approach. And a method-based approach means that if you do habit X, then you're gonna get result Y. If you eat this type of food, then you're going to get fat or sick or weak or lose your gains or whatever the case may be. But when we look at how fitness actually works, how nutrition actually works, both from an evidence-based scientific research standpoint and just anecdotally from just looking around at what's going on in real life, we recognize that that's not at all how food works. There are billions of people all over the planet who eat junk food and sugar and fat and processed foods, and they're perfectly fine. I spent, year, uh, spent a lot of time in Japan. I lived in Japan in college. Everybody's eating processed grains. Nobody's fat. 
nobody has heart disease. Nobody's getting all these bad things that everybody says is so terrible for you. And why? It's because that's not how nutrition works. You're not going to be able to fully fend off these negative occurrences just because you don't eat bread or because you don't eat sugar or whatever. And furthermore, it's a very weak approach to say, well, if I don't want to get fat, I don't want to get sick, I don't want to have heart disease or whatever, so therefore I just won't eat the foods that are linked to it. Okay, that's fine, but it's usually a pretty ineffective way to go about doing it because, again, there's billions of people who eat those foods who don't have those problems, and furthermore, there's lots of people who have those problems who don't eat those foods. So we can't say it's do X, get result Y in our fitness culture because there's plenty of evidence against that all around us every single day. And one of the biggest reasons why that we have these messages that they don't work is simply because that we're losing sight of some of the most basic principles of how fitness and diet and exercise work, which is effectively that your results largely depend on a whole host of other circumstances outside of those habits. I made a video last week of I was eating some candy on the chairlift. I was riding up on Eagle Wind uh, at Winter Park. And Eagle Wind is almost like side country skiing. It's not groomed. It's all trees and bumps and uh, ravines and stuff. I mean, there's just no easy way down the mountain from that. So by the time you get to the bottom, you are absolutely smoked because there's just no easy groomers there. There's no easy skiing. And so uh, the point I was making is like, I'm eating candy, but I'm eating candy on a day when I'm doing top to bottom bump runs for hours at a time. That's a very different scenario for my body than eating that same candy if I was sitting at my desk all day. Very different scenario, very different outcome. It'd be like if I said, if you wear this jacket, this, this parka, are you going to become overheated? Well, if you're in Southern Florida and it's 98 degrees out, possibly yes. But if you were again up at Winter Park and it was 20 degrees and snowing like a mother, then probably no. But we lose all manner of this context and all manner of this nuance when it comes to so many messages in our fitness culture and exercise, where it's like, if you do X, you're going to get result Y. Like you just took about a, a huge dose of nuance and complexity and totally ignored it. And that's a huge disservice. <clears throat> All the while, making you more fearful of, oh, I'd better not eat those Girl Scout cookies. Thank God they're out right now. Love me some tagalongs. I was uh, enjoying those the other day. And people are like, oh my gosh, if I eat those, I'm going to get diabetes. I'm going to get fat. I'm going to get out of shape. And it's like, there's nothing saying that you will. Yes, there may be a correlation between eating certain foods and certain outcomes or certain ways and stuff. But again, tons of nuance you're totally throwing out. Without that nuance, you're literally now talking in the world of pure science fiction. And so we get these fears of like, I'm terrified of eating this food. I'm terrified of eating these other foods. You know, I used to be like that. I used to be afraid of food. I used to be afraid of eating certain foods. And that would make, give me a lot of anxiety. Where it was, oh man, we're going out for this restaurant and we're, they're going to have these foods on the menu. Can they make changes and stuff? I used to be anxious about just simply having lunch. And that's no way to have a healthy approach to food. It's just simply not possible because even if you ate, quote, perfectly well, one, that control you think you have is a complete illusion. You're not going to have complete control over your weight and your health and your blood sugar and everything like that because you avoid certain foods. There's a lot more to those outcomes than just what is on your plate, a lot more. So you're one, you're ignoring a lot of those other influences to your detriment usually. And two is that, that control is just a pure illusion. It gives you a feeling of control, which is really what we're addicted to, not actual control, but uh, it's making you work so much harder for no good reason. Like there, unless you've got medical reasons to avoid certain foods or allergies and things like that, that you usually don't need to worry about those foods as long as you're not over consuming and or in general or abusing food. And as a result, we have all these fears and these anxieties that really don't benefit us at all. We don't really have that much control. And I know that's a scary message for a lot of people to entertain because they don't like me telling, saying things like that. Because again, we love that sense of control. We love the idea that if I just don't eat sugar, I'm always gonna be fine. 
I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to be lean. I'm going to live to be 120. I'm going to be able to build muscle. All I have to do is just not eat sugar or processed foods or fat or whatever the thing is, right? And that's, again, it's simply not how nutrition works. So a lot of times we literally become addicted to a false narrative of how things work just because it gives us a greater feeling of control. And in many cases, it could even be removing control from your hands. You could have be less powerful. You can be more powerless over your outcomes and your ability to actually improve your out, your results. But we humans, we don't care. We just want something that gives us a feeling of control. And that's what we uh, will anchor ourselves to. Let's see what, uh, <clears throat> what we can say uh, here. Len is coming back on saying, I've noticed that longevity experts who we see on social media often change their narrative based on updated research. Always felt consistency, moderation is key. Yeah, and so it's good to update your approaches and opinions and thoughts on things as you learn more. Absolutely. Never trust somebody who's like, yep, I've been telling people to eat and exercise the same way for the past 30 years. That's usually someone who hasn't grown very much. <laughs> you know, it's a good thing to look back on your life and be like, oh man, I can't believe I did this or believed this or taught this 10 years ago. Oh my gosh. I, and that's how it should be. You know, we should look back on our younger selves and think like, well, that, that wasn't quite the best thing to do. And it doesn't necessarily mean you're right or wrong or stuff. It's just your approaches and your methods should always be looking to evolve and improve and stuff. So yeah, changing with new information should certainly be the way to go. I mean, I've got my methods, I've got my approaches, I've got my ways that I like to do things, but I'll be the first to tell you that I have no loyalty at all to everything that I teach. As soon as I find something better, boom, it's out of here and I'm moving on to that other thing. I'm not going to like, you know, stick my flag in the sand and have a hill to die on and be like, this is the way I will approach things now for the rest of my life. No, I'm more than uh, happy to change my thoughts and opinions on things as I learn more and evolve. And it's probably never going to be so much uh, or not never, but something that it's like, oh, I was totally wrong. And now I believe this other 180 degree issue. No, it's usually more of, well, I was looking at it and I thought I was right, but it turns out I was missing a lot of that, again, contextual nuance and stuff that was more important to put into things. So yeah, we should be, uh, but consistency, you're right, is important. And um, moderation is a weird, weird thing though, because moderation usually just refers to the acceptance of whatever you're comfortable with already. If you take someone who smokes a pack a day and ask them what moderation is, they'll say smoking a pack a day. You know, if you take someone who eats um, McDonald's three times a week and what's moderation in McDonald's three times a week kind of thing. So I don't like the idea of, of moderation, but we do want to look for improvements and elevating things to a higher level. But yeah, you're right. Uh, the, the extremes are usually not where we're going to be living. Uh, our best life, the extreme diets, the extreme workouts, the extreme approaches, the things that are all the way left or all the way black or white or whatever. It's usually more in the gray where we're going to have our best lives. And again, a lot of the fear-based messages out there don't encourage that. Joseph Bell is saying, hold on, I do squats with a 25-pound dumbbell, and then I do either walking lunges, sliding lunges, reverse lunges after the squats. Should I do just one of those exercises and drop set it or do both as I am now. Now you could do either way there. Remember that a lot of these compound leg exercises are fundamentally the same basic idea. Lunges are squats, squats are lunges. They're hip to heel movement. That's what the, uh, the squat chain is, is hip to heel. We're getting our hips closer to our heels and then we're pulling, pushing them back apart. That's fundamentally what those exercises are. So in your case, and I remember the videos that you had showed me and stuff, we talked about range of motion being the biggest thing that you want to be working on with that. Uh, again, I, I think you moved up to the goblet squat with that. Do you have a heavier dumbbell than 25 too, by the way? Uh, I can't remember if you told me or not in our email interactions. But um, so for example, we, so you got the, the squats, 25 pound dumbbell, and then do either walking lunges, sliding reverse lunges after the squats. So yeah, you're very smart to be either the sliding reverse or the walking lunges because they're so similar. They're pretty redundant if you did both. 
and you're asking what I do one of those extra drop set as I do now. So I would I would keep with a unilateral squat chain exercise and a bilateral squat chain exercise. So here's one that I would I'm gonna throw to you. Give this a try. Is take a, a length of space like in a hallway or a big gym or something like that. Do your squats on one end and then walking lunge to the other end and then do squats there and then lunge back. That's a fun way to go about things. It's a one of those really time efficient uh, micro workouts that works pretty darn well. Henry Reed, good to talk to you again. He's saying, Matt, what are some metrics or milestones I can use to track my progress over time with my strength, stability, and progressions? Love you, man. And uh, same to you. So a lot of times uh, milestones, uh, they're always individual to what we're doing. You know, sometimes a, a milestone could be like, I want to be able to run 10 miles. Okay, great. Uh, other people could be like, I want to be able to run one mile. Uh, sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, this is the milestone you should shoot for. But you want to keep these milestones relative to your own capabilities. It's something that is relative to you. So for example, you could have a milestone of I can hold my breath for three minutes. I'm like, great. What the heck does that have to do with my ability to build stronger legs? <laughs> you know, so pick milestones that are relative to the goals that you have and just outside of reach of what you currently can do. So if you're doing your archer pushups like we did this morning, then have the milestone of trying to get uh, five good reps with your arm with your arm more underneath you rather than to the side of you. These are things that are always just in context of what we're actually doing and always relative to the goals that you're going after as well. Don't just accept uh, blatant milestones. Uh, you know, you hear this in recommendations. Oh, you're not really strong unless you can do X, Y, and Z and stuff. Eh, it kind of depends on, on your abilities and the context of things. Alex A is saying, hey, Matt, I just started rock climbing this week. Any tips? So there's, there's something that was a milestone. Okay, heading a, a certain route, for example, could be a milestone for a rock climber. Any tips on how to start? How can I be incorporating GSC program, my strength, hands, arms? Yeah, basic. So remember that GSC is very much a very basic strength training program. So it's not specific to anything. It doesn't need to be specific to anything. 90% of the conditioning that you're going to get for rock climbing is going to be from rock climbing. Exactly. You can modify a couple things to make it a little bit more applicable doing like your pull-ups on something like a hangboard or something uh, can be good. Rock rings uh, can be a fun way to go about it just to get your grip strength a little bit more integrated into some of the programs. But um, yeah, it's not something that you're going to have to really mix and match around. Uh, be mindful. And, and this is a thing I get a lot where people are like, okay, I do multiple things. How do I incorporate it? Depends on a ton of variables, depends on how long you're climbing, depends on how often you're climbing, depends on your current abilities, depends on sleep and depends on stress and depends on your job and depends on you know, how you feel about uh, the workouts and everything. So basically modify either, you'll have probably a priority of either your strength training or your rock climbing. Spend most of your time and energy doing that. And then the other one is more supplemental. And when it comes to the ability to uh, train well, within so it's not exhausting it's just adjust the volume of one versus the other if you find it's exhausting you a little bit too much and with regards to beginning rock climbing get a coach sign up for an introductory lesson there at the you know the local gym or something uh, and see if you've got someone who can give you some of the basic you know if you pardon the pun show you the ropes uh, for that sort of thing and you'll be a much faster startup for that sort of thing so we're continuing on talking about fears in our fitness culture, some of these messages that promote fear. And this next kind of fear is kind of this catch-all perspective and phrase that refers to natural undulations within our body that we're told to be afraid of. So these are things like uh, back in, again, the, the day inflammation was a huge thing. People are like, oh, don't eat that food. It causes inflammation. Oh, don't do that type of training. It causes inflammation and stuff like that. Uh, another one that's really common these days is like blood sugar. You know, all these blood sugar readings and stuff that we have and stuff. The fact of the matter is that these are things that are supposed to fluctuate. They're going to fluctuate from time to time. Same thing with your motivation. Same thing with your energy level. 
Same thing with your strength. Same thing with how your body feels and stuff. Your body is in a very highly transient state on a day-to-day -day basis. You're never going to be on this dead, solid, steady state of almost anything with your body. Your blood sugar is supposed to spike and it's supposed to go down. Your ability to, or your inflammation levels in your body is supposed to go up and down. But now we've got all these little tools and gadgets and gizmos and programs and everything that are saying like, oh my gosh, if you've got any inflammation, it's this terrible, horrible thing, or blood sugar spiking is a horrible thing and promotes you know, weight gain and all these sorts of things. Again, taken way out of context. Everybody's blood sugar and inflammation and all this sort of thing is going to go up and it's going to go down and it's going to go up and down and all over the place. And it's supposed to. Okay? You're never going to be able to get it dead level all of the time. And even if you could, I would certainly make the argument that that's probably unhealthy because there's a lot of adaptation that the body goes through in order to accommodate and become more resilient with these fluctuations in our physical state. You know, a good, healthy body should be able to handle a blood, blood sugar spike very well. If I eat something, blood sugar goes up. Yeah, it's supposed to. It's a healthy reaction. It's supposed to do that. Same with blood pressure, you know, with isometrics and uh, the training and stuff. People are like, ah, blood pressure could go up. Yeah, I want it to go up. I want it to spike when I'm holding an isometric deadlift. A lot of times the real issue is not these fluctuations and changes, but chronic elevations and changes over time. But we get so acute with all these little devices like, oh my gosh, my blood pressure or my blood sugar just went up last past 20 minutes or my, I'm more inflamed now this morning than I was last night. I'm like, yeah, sure, fine. Who cares? It's perfectly all right. You know, a resilient body handles fluctuations very well. Sometimes I'm hot. Sometimes I'm cold. Sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I got energy. This, this is how we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be in a static steady state of anything with our body. And usually trying to maintain that steady state of anything makes us more fragile because then when we do experience fluctuations and undulations, we get overloaded very, very quickly. And this is, again, this is, is uh, something that came about a long time ago when uh, people were trying to really have that optimal diet. Like, I don't want any sort of uh, these certain foods like processed foods and everything in my diet and stuff. And then they would have like, a fun size Snickers bar or something and be like, oh my gosh, you know, now it's having all these effects on my body and I've got a headache and everything. It's like, yeah, because you're weak. You know, your body can't handle a simple donut hole like because your diet was so restricted and so like clean and perfect that it took nothing to overload you. It's kind of like saying, oh, exercise is stressing out my body. So I'm just going to become as inactive as humanly possible and subject myself to as little physical stress. I'm just going to lay in bed here all day long. And then you, you get up and you throw out your back going to the bathroom. Why? Because you became so weak and in, fragile that it took nothing to break you. And it's the same thing oftentimes when we have these, quote, optimal diet or exercise programs and stuff that are so restrictive. And they're trying to keep our body from going through these undulations and uh, fluctuations in these things. So even if you can manage to keep things very static and steady, then it takes almost no fluctuation to break you. It takes very little to really uh, upset your apple cart. So there's all these m machines out there and devices of like, look at your blood sugar and your inflammation and all these other sorts of things. And unless you have a medical reason to do it, don't worry about it. Again, I've got the you know, little fitness trackers and stuff like that on my Apple Watch. I don't care about any of that stuff. I don't care if I have 2,000 steps one day and 10,000 steps the next day. So what? It doesn't matter. Usually these little acute fluctuations and stuff don't matter because what really matters is what, what's your overall uh, performance or situation over the course of the next month? What's your energy level like over the next week? That's the stuff that really matters the most. It's the same thing in you know, the stock market and things. People are losing their hair and freaking out like crazy because the stock market goes down for like an hour and then it's back up and they're ecstatic and stuff versus a lot of long-term investors are like, what's the long-term gain over the next 10 years? That's what I want to know about. And so a lot of the fear-based messages in our fitness culture is like, oh, you've got to you know, really radically control your blood sugar. You've got to radically control for inflammation. 
And these messages, again, way out of context, because what they're telling you to focus on is usually a fairly small influence to that thing. Again, back in the old, you know, paleo eating days and the CrossFits and stuff like that, they made it seem like everything about inflammation was about pasta, you know, and eating bread. And if you didn't eat those things, you wouldn't have any inflammation and stuff. Meanwhile, we'd be putting ourselves through these workouts that would just destroy us and leave us so incredibly sore for five straight days. And we're like, oh, but I'd better not eat that sandwich. Oh no, that would really make me inflamed. I'm like, why do you think your legs are so sore for three straight days? That's inflammation. You've got inflammation like crazy from your workouts, but you're afraid of eating a few chocolate chips on, you know, your your paleo pancakes or whatever. It's like, come on, we're pound, we're penny wise and pound foolish. We're focusing and uh, majoring in minor things while ignoring a lot of other major things that are still contributing to things that we're trying to avoid. So it's usually a whole bunch of work and hassle and stuff for a whole bunch of nothing is basically what I'm saying. I don't give a damn about my blood sugar. I don't care about inflammation. I don't care about any of these things unless they start going chronically wrong. And in which case I'm going to see a doctor about these sorts of things, or I'm going to take bigger steps than just not eating pasta a side of pasta. When I go out for dinner tonight, usually the things that we're told to do to regulate those fluctuations are pretty weak and being able to manage it in the first place. So it's, again, fear about something that isn't really all that uh, big a deal. Cristobal is saying, hey Matt, in your opinion, what's the best way to improve grip strength besides for basic pulling movements? Yeah, basic pulling movements for the most part. Always remember my friends, the most basic principle in exercise science, the said principle, specific adaptation to impose demand, teaches you about 90% of everything you're ever gonna need to know about exercise science. If you understand the said principle, you're pretty much set. I cover that again in many of my books, Smart Body Weight Training, Fitness Independence, and so on. And uh, one of the most basic lessons of the said principle is you gain that which you challenge. So anything that just challenges your grip is going to build a stronger grip. And that's why you've got you know grip tools and stuff like hanging from towels or big fat bars that rotate and things like that. That's the stuff that's going to challenge your grip even more. Whatever makes it harder to hold on to something is going to challenge your grip. There you go. But usually basic pulling is the way to go. That's all that you really need uh, to be utilizing. Fatter grips, grips that are less stable that you have a harder time holding on to, that's a good way to go about it. And before that, you followed up saying, uh, is doing overcoming isometric a heavy compound like squat deadlift on the same day on a regular basis, a good idea, or is it too much for the lower back? No, it should be fine. Remember, my friends, lower back's like a joint. If you feel it in your lower back, it means the supportive muscle groups are not doing their job. So yeah, if you feel it in that muscle, then back off. You know, Is it too much? I don't know. There are people out there who could do 10 times the work and be fine. There are other people out there who's like, dude, I do two sets of bodyweight deadlifts or um, uh, basic uh, isometric deadlifts, and my back is killing me. Okay, that's a you problem. That's not a programming problem, but uh, you got to listen to those sorts of things. If you're overloading it and you're like, wow, I really feel it in my lower back, that's a big problem. And uh, that way we can adjust according to your abilities and your capabilities. And again, adjust the volume is probably the best way to go. Joseph's coming back on saying, Matt, I have adjustable dumbbells. I can put more weight on. I have 50 pounds. I can load them. Good. Uh, what do you think an isometric hold the bottom of the squat with a dumbbell with one of them is, yeah, probably a good idea, especially since you were struggling with the range of motion there, Joseph, as I was talking about earlier, being able to hold that bottom position may be a very good thing for you. I would definitely play with it. Prioritize your range of motion. And if you can get deeper, then start getting heavier. Load that sucker up. Uh, let's see, what are the things that we, we told to uh, kind of have fear over when it comes to our fitness culture. Uh, one of which, and this is a much more subtle one, and this it permeates a lot of uh, our kind of, uh, I guess, entrepreneurial culture a little bit. It's just a simple the hustle culture idea of you're not working hard enough. You know, you you need to work harder. You got to work harder at what you're doing. You're not working harder, and this is why a lot of times people will just overdrive themselves right into the ground is because we feel like, well, if I'm not getting the good enough results, that means I'm not working hard enough. 
if I'm not getting what I want or I'm just simply not uh, optimizing or maximizing things, I'm not working hard enough. And to some degree, yes, working harder, just simply putting in more time and effort can be a very good strategy, especially if you're not working very hard to begin with, right? But always remember that hard work has a diminishing rate of return, and it's oftentimes the refuge of those who don't know what they're doing. You know, don't, don't always be bragging about being the hardest worker in the room. A lot of times the hardest worker in the room is also the most inept an incompetent person in the room. Because when you don't know what you're doing, you usually have to work twice as hard to make something happen. So this whole idea of I've got to work harder, I've got to run more miles, I've got to do more push-ups, I've got to do more workouts, I got to do more, 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 more. Yeah, to a degree it helps, but more is not always better. And remember that, especially if we're doing more of the same thing, you're getting to the point where you've got a diminishing rate of return, but an exponential increase in personal cost and stress. And we were talking about the one set a day approach. And one of the big advantages of one set a day is that you're doing, well, one set of an exercise, let's say, you know, you know pull-ups, for example. And so you're keeping a lot of that exponential increase in cost at bay but you're potentially getting a lot of that initial benefit because it's kind of in the first set. So if you think of it like two opposing lines, you know, the first set you do has a lot of benefit and the next one has some more, but not as much. And the next set is some more and not as much. And it's a decreasing benefit over time. Meanwhile, you have a line going in the other direction, uh, opposing that where it's an increase in cost, stress on your joints, stress on your uh, nervous system, stress on your schedule, stress on motivation, all these sorts of things. So by having one set a day, we're potentially getting the most of that initial benefit with the lowest cost. So when we're going back to the idea of path of least resistance, getting as much benefit from the least amount of personal cost. Now, will you get more from doing more? Absolutely in that case. But remember, you're now spending exponentially more too. And so we want to pay attention to where's that point where it's still worth it. And when we have that fear in the back of our minds of, I'm just not working hard enough. I'm just not putting in enough. I'm just not working myself into the ground. Again, usually that comes from not knowing what we're doing because we don't have a clear objective of what we're trying to accomplish in our diet and exercise habits. And so we're just pushing ourselves more and more and more. We're getting less and less and less while also at the same time spending more and more and more. So don't worry about how much you're working. Worry, or not worry, but focus on how well you're working, how well you're able to accomplish what you want. As my uh, uh, approaches on adaptive training go, you know, you're not training for the sake of doing work. You're training to accomplish an objective. And so you're going to do however much work you either need to do or can do in your given circumstances. If you don't have a lot of time and energy and motivation, don't do a whole heck of a lot. Don't force it. You just don't have the resources for it. But you can still accomplish something. But sometimes the objective is to do a particular thing. Like I want to run a 5K. Okay, you're going to put in enough work to run 5K, not more, but not less, because you have an objective. But when you don't know what your objective is, then you run the risk of saying, I've just got to do more and more and more, and there's no finish line, and you run right into the ground from that sort of thing, because you don't know what you're trying to accomplish in your workouts or your diet air uh, activities. You don't know what you're doing. It's that simple. Mm. Good one here. Naomu, I hope I'm pronouncing that, my friend. Make a point on how to improve joint strength. Simple, stronger muscles. Okay, You don't need to make your joints stronger. Bottom line. As a friend of mine once told me, he's like, your joints are as strong and as mobile as the day you were born. And they're always going to be that way. And you don't have to do a damn thing about it. It's the muscles and tissues around the joint that get weak and unstable and stiff and tight. That's what causes the problems. And that's what is mostly facing people when they have bad depth. Of course, if, you know, it's like, I've got rheumatoid arthritis in my joints. Okay, that's a direct joint issue. I've got an ACL tear or something. Yes, your joint is actually damaged. You need to go see a professional about getting it fixed. 
But usually when we have joint issues, it's not at all a joint issue. It's a muscle issue. Something along your chain is not engaging properly. I'm going to be making a video next week. Make sure you subscribe to the channel on various signs that your tension control and your neuromuscular proficiency sucks, which is very much the common case in many people. And it's only getting worse these days because we have trouble engaging our muscles and using them in a synergistic way along the other muscles of the tension chain. And one of the biggest signs of poor tension control is nagging joint aches and pains because the stress is supposed to go into the muscles, not the tissues around the joints. And so the best way to strengthen, quote, your joints is to make your muscles and supportive uh, musculature associated with that joint much stronger and engaged better. And so make sure you, you're following and uh, I'll get that video out next week. Hey, Matt, Ben Ben saying, do you deload sometimes? What are your opinion on deloads? Usually I just deload as life warrants. Like again, the past week or so has been an absolute uh, crap shoot. Uh, my energy level has been absolutely terrible. I've been uh, physically and mentally just pretty darn low. So this week has been one hell of a deload. I'll tell you that much. Uh, I have not been up for much of anything. I'm taking like two naps a day. Uh, I'm not in a very good place uh, physically. And so deloading <laughs> because I'm just not doing very much. When you have adaptive training habits like I do, deloads just happen automatically. You don't need to plan them out or make them happen. Your body, your mind, your lifestyle will make it happen uh, as needed. And if you don't need it, just keep going. Leona saying, hey, Matt, I'm kind of struggling to properly feel my biceps during ring bicep curls. Yes, I feel that it's a matter of my wrist positioning. Any tips? Well, it could also possibly be a little bit to the fact that you're doing them on rings. Rings are tough. Rings are hard to do curls on because they just don't rotate. So you got to kind of make it happen in your wrist. You got to get the angles in your wrist. Whereas usually I prefer suspension handles where the handle can twist and rotate. It's a far more ergonomic and uh, friendly way to go about doing curls to have something that can be moving like so. Um, here's what I would recommend. Hang from a pull-up bar and practice tensing your biceps in, the in that hanging position. So this is what I was talking about earlier with tension control and uh, neuromuscular proficiency. A lot of us have trouble just turning on and engaging the muscle to begin with. And that's the thing with tension control. It's the foundation of all of our success, especially with strength training. If your tension control in a muscle is fairly low, then nothing you do will ever work very well. Not a single exercise, no programming, no tools. You can change anything around. And if your brain has trouble engaging that muscle, you're always going to struggle to make it bigger and stronger. But the good news is the opposite's the case. If you can get that tension control to be much better, you can do pretty much anything and it's gonna work awesome. I know a guy who built huge thighs just running, just going for jogs because his tension control in his quads was insane. So it's one of those things that we may need to work on. So hang from a pull-up bar, tense the biceps. If you're not tensing the biceps, you're able to really engage the muscles. And if you're asking like, well, how do I know if they're engaged? Well, that's a problem then no, <laughs> they're not really that engaged because when you can engage a muscle very well, you sure as hell will feel it. There's no doubt about that. And just practicing that over and over and over will eventually get it uh, dialed in. So there, there you go. I hope, hope you can get some gains in those biceps there, my friend. T.S. Long saying, what's the easiest way to add 30 pounds of muscle to stop insulin resistance, reduce glucose? Should we just be doing compound exercise for the bigger muscles, groups, legs, back, chest, everything, my friend, everything, hit everything. Why focus anywhere? Get everything done. So push, pull, squat is still probably going to be your best bet. And again, that's why I wrote the little ebook that I have over at Delta Project, reddeltaproject.com is most of the time building muscle is going to come from your push, pull, and squat movement patterns. That's where the majority of those types of gains, if you will, will come from is push, pull, and squat. Focus on those. And yeah, the bigger compound movements, good activation, tension control. Plus, you know, the more you can engage muscles, the more blood and more sugar you're going to burn up anyway. The more muscle you can engage in an exercise, the more of that 
sugar you're burning up. That's literally what the burn in muscles is, is you're taking sugar and basically, you know, burning it right on up. I mean, it's an analogy. It's not exactly like that, but you kind of get the idea. And don't worry too much about 30 pounds of muscle. Um, first off, most people will never even build 10 pounds of muscle. Uh, 30 pounds of muscle is an obscene amount of muscle. Most, most people will never even come close to that. Uh, so focus on that first 10 pounds because that first 10 pounds will make a big difference. And second of all, don't, uh, I wouldn't put all your eggs in that one basket, of course. If you're trying to manage like a pre-diabetic state or uh, things like that, medical condition, like also look at things like high intensity cardio, also looking at your diet, also looking at your sleep. Uh, I don't know if you're on uh, any sort of like insulin or anything like that, but make sure you're adjusting that according to what your uh, proper condition is. You want to have as many variables in play as possible. Uh, don't try and be like, okay, I'm going to put on 30 pounds of muscle. And that's the one shot I've got at being able to manage this diabetic or pre-diabetic scenario. Anytime we're trying to manage something through one variable, it's going to be twice as hard for half the results. Uh, so focus on uh, as many different variables as you can. And a lot of people, I know they, they poo-poo cardio like crazy. Cardio is fantastic, especially the high intensity stuff. You know, doing sprint work and things like that can be fantastic. So let's see other other things. Um, FOMO is another big thing that gets us anxious and fearful in our fitness culture. And it's a lot to do with the marketing messages out there. Like, oh, if you're not doing this revolutionary, amazing thing, then you're missing out. Eh, it's probably a good thing, but it's probably no different than anything else out there that's going to be effective. Oh, if you're doing, you're not doing this, you're missing out. You've got to do this. Or, oh, if you're doing it that way, you're going to kill your gain. So you got to do it this other way. Remember, my friends, that for the most part, when it comes to general fitness, losing weight, building muscle, health, wellness, those sorts of, they're not dependent on any particular method, okay? It doesn't matter if you're doing calisthenics or, or Olympic lifting or if you're doing hill sprints or sprinting on a, a bicycle or going out for a good long walk and stuff. For the most part, as long as you're doing the general fundamental objectives, the actual methods you're using isn't all that important. It's more important that it just aligns for you, that it fits your schedule and your preferences and your abilities. So when we're looking at a lot of these kind of anxious messages of like, oh, if you're not doing this, you're missing out and oh, this is the best thing in the world. Chances are that thing that they're talking about is no more better or worse than everything else that can possibly work. Because that's usually what ends up happening is some new device comes out or some new program or some new diet or some new approach and stuff. And it can be great. It can be fantastic. Yeah, definitely give it a shot. But is it any different and unique on a fundamental level of anything else? Not really. So just do whatever the heck you want. And if someone's like, oh, if you're not doing this, you're missing out. Eh, so what? It, probably not missing out on much of anything important, to be perfectly honest with you. Because a lot of stuff comes out and it gets a lot of hype. And we're, we have more FOMO over the hype than the actual effectiveness and benefit of the actual thing. Because it's the hype that we feel jealous, anxious, and envious of, not whether or not it's actually effective. Because a lot of stuff that's good out there is good, but it's really not that great. And if it's bad, it's eh, probably something to be mindful of and a little bit, okay, let's not do too much of this or that. But it's probably not that big, big a deal. It's probably not that bad uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Let me see if there's anything else that I can jump in here on what are you uh, fearful of we got. Oh, and then the last time, last one point that I wanted to make is there's a lot of messages out there that kind of portray achieving a given result in fitness as a very precise undertaking, a very scientifically exact thing. But the fact is, folks, we're not putting a tin can on Mars here. Right, you got to get your measurements really precise and exactly correct if you want to put a probe on a distant planet. But remember that fitness as a whole is so general and so basic and so fundamental that it literally happens completely by accident to most people on the planet. 
we build muscle and get stronger and lose weight and have our body go through these physiological adaptations, uh, largely by pure chance and luck. It's so basic and general. So when someone's like, okay, I've got this weight loss program and you've got to eat exactly this precise way and you've got to train exactly this precise way within this narrow heart rate range in this zone and all these. So I'm like, no, no, you don't need that. I mean, literally there's billions of people on the other side of the planet who don't need a, don't know a carbohydrate from a superset and they're perfectly fine, lean and healthy without knowing any of this stuff. So this idea of I've got to get things just right in order to be uh, have a chance of getting what I want. No, you don't. This is not rocket science. It doesn't need a super high level of precision and exact measurements and everything in order for it to be effective. You know, a lot of times we can do things in a much more generalized way and still be perfectly fine. Sometimes when I'm training people and they're like, okay, I'm warming up with this exercise, how many am I going to do? I'm like, a bunch. Just do a bunch until you start to feel like you're a little burn in the muscle. Yeah, but well, how many should I do? You don't need a number. You don't need a precision number. Does it really matter if you do 10 versus 15? No. Does it really matter if I you know, say do 20 versus no, not really kind of thing? Just do, do a bunch. We're just getting the, the work in. We're just practicing here sort of thing. I want to burn more calories. Go out for a walk. How long should I walk, walk for? Go out for a long walk. You know, The more you do, the more you burn. How fast should I be going? What heart rate zone should I be in? What kind of shoes should I wear? How many, you know, should I wear this type of food? What kind of carbohydrate ratio should I be? Way overthinking this sort of thing. This is not rocket science. The majority of people who get the best results when it comes to anything in fitness, they're like, yeah, I just do a crap ton of this and I don't do very much of that. Well, how many grams of protein do you eat? I don't know. I eat protein to a good degree at each meal. If I think I need more protein, I'm just going to eat more of what I normally eat. How many is that? I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't matter. We just need the general changes and fluctuations over time to get what we want. Last question coming on in. Citrus is coming and saying, hey, Matt, do you ever worry about losing progress when switching up the movements in your routine? I hesitate to introduce new alternative movements, even though I know it's not all about the numbers. No, not really. Um, for once, for one thing, and here's another fr uh, thing that we're told to fear and worry about is losing progress, uh, regressing in things. First off, no, you're going to lose progress many times throughout your training career. I, I mean, right now I'm in the middle of ski season, you know, so I'm skiing. I have a shiny new mountain bike over there that hasn't seen dirt in over four months. I guarantee you the first time I go out for a mountain bike ride, it's going to hurt. <laughs> Why? Because I've lost a lot of progress in my ability to have the strength and endurance to ride my mountain bike. But I also know I'm going to get almost all of it back within a week or two. So I'm not worried about it. You know, we're always going to be making progress, but also losing progress somewhere at some point in our, uh, our fitness journey. I was training a client this morning. She's been super sick and stuff. So she got into the gym today and she's a little behind the eight ball. It's like, yeah, You've been sick for three weeks. Of course, you're going to lose some progress over those three weeks. Does it matter? No, not really. You know, is it something to worry about? No. No, you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to take steps back and you're going to move forward. Now, in pertaining your question here, no, as long as I've got the same basic movement pattern, I'm going to get the same basic result. You know, so if you're talking about you know, switching up movement patterns, Let's say I'm doing lat pull downs instead of pull ups. No, it's the same basic fundamental thing. It's always about what are you fundamentally doing? A hip hinge. Am I doing hip bridges versus kettlebell swings versus deadlifts? Does it really matter for most people? No, not really. Just get the basic movement pattern push, pull, and squat. I don't care what the exercise is. As long as it's sufficiently challenging, then you're going to get the same basic result no matter what kind of exercise that you're really doing. Now, if you're really precise about it, though, and let's say you were uh, doing pistol squats for ever in a day, and then you switch it up and you're like, I'm going to do leg press. Okay, they're both basic leg uh, squat chain movements, but you don't do pistol squats at all for, let's say, six months. I guarantee you come back to the pistol squats, you're probably going to be like, whoa, these are totally you know, kicking my butt. Oh, I've lost a step on my pistol squat. 
Yeah, because you haven't done them in six months. The precise nature of that said principle is telling you that what you needed to do those pistol squats, you regressed somewhere, the stability, the hip mobility, the control, whatever, you lost a step or two. Again, does it matter? No, not really. Because if you just get back into the pistol squats in a week or two, you'll get it back. You'll be fine. It's not really a, that big a deal. So no, I don't worry about it because most of the time you're not going to lose any uh, gains or, or any progress. Even if you do, you're going to get them back real quick anyway. But you're probably going to be better off with a bit of variety in what type of techniques and uh, things that you're utilizing anyway. All right, my friends, I have to help a friend move some furniture upstairs. So I will bid you adieu. Don't forget, check out all of the resources that I've been referencing in today's episode. Everything is over at reddeltaproject.com. Link is down below. The coaching programs, micro coaching, all of the books. Again, the new quick read is coming out hopefully this week on uh, adaptive training. One of the most powerful, liberating, and impactful things I ever did in my fitness career was adapt more of an adaptive training mindset. And the quick read ebook is going to be out fairly soon. It's also going to be at a pretty low price point as well. So make sure you check that out. And also the uh, video that I'm going to be coming out with this week on the RDP YouTube channel, all about basically bulletproofing your joints uh, through better neuromuscular proficiency to improve every workout you ever do. That video will be coming out later this week as well. So you know, subscribe, notifications, all that sort of thing. Or if you're listening to this podcast, probably a past the end of February, then it's probably already up. You can look for it. So, all right, folks, thank you so much for coming in, chiming in with your questions. Good to talk to you as always. I hope you have a great weekend. And as always, be fit and live free.